Come and dream with me. Hello, welcome to What Do You Want to Watch, the Explosion Network's premier media podcast. Every week we go together to talk about movies, TV, and online content. Help you answer the question, who had Larry David attacking Elmo on their 2024 bingo card? Not me. I'm your host, Ash Hobley. Join me today, Dylan Blight. I wish I did. It's pretty funny. <laughs> Good old Larry. What a, you know, what promotion for the final season of Cope. What a lad. You know? Elmo just took that, take that, took that take on the chin, you know, for game after. What a nice little monster. All right. On today's show, we'll be talking about what's in the Washington Street, going over a little bit of film news, uh, given this week's top three and given sometimes the trailers. Uh, kicking things off, I went to the cinema and watched Argyle, the latest Ma- Matthew Vaughn film uh, starring uh, Bryce Dallas Howard, Sam Rockwell, Henry Cavill, Brian Cranston, and Catherine Hara. Sophia Batella, Dua Lipa, uh, follows... But those last two just came with such a, like, <laughs> dot, dot, dot. Yes. Julie. You know. <laughs> uh, follows a novelist played by Bryce Dallas Howard, who uh, is writing a bunch of spy novels, uh, but her spy novels are mirroring things that happen in the real world, uh, which captures the attention of uh, several secret spy agencies who want to extract her to get the information about what the next book is actually going to be um it's <laughs> <laughs> tell me more <laughs> if you've got like that podcast feature on the that uh kills uh silence Time. you really you really missed that <laughs> you missed out on that awkward pause um i mean it's it's a fine yeah. spy movie yep obviously it's going hardest it's like very meta and there's lots of in jokes and obviously you see uh the spy argyle depicted by henry cavill uh, in sequences, and the not Bryce Dallas Howard's character also um, like visualizes him when uh, Sam Rockwell's spy character like does stuff. She's imagining him in his place and that kind of stuff. Ah, uh, that's why he's in it more. Gotcha. That's why he's in it more. Um, she constantly is seeing Henry Cavill all over the place and like talking Me to too. him, uh, <laughs> uh, talking to him and that kind of stuff. Um, yeah, I mean, I feel like it's. Matthew Vaughn like delving even harder into the stuff he was kind of doing in The Kingsman um, but with like this meta commentary idea on top of it um, I think yeah as the movie goes on like the the big marketing thing was who is the real Argyle who is the real who's the real agent Argyle and I feel like at least for me I like was pretty confident who it was uh, at least halfway through, uh, the movie, um, or well, like halfway till the point they <laughs> reveal who smart. Agent Argyle is, um, and I don't think I'm super smart. I just think you know, you just narrow down the the number of people it could potentially be. Um, I think that there's some solid twists. I guess. Um, there's also some fun action sequences. Sam Rockwell is doing his best uh, with what he's given. Um. Yeah. It and it, again, there's like the visual Matthew Vaughn thing where he just really likes coloured smoke for some reason. That's the thing. Instead of like blood everywhere, uh, maybe it's like a sensor thing. <laughs> you can get away with uh, more murder in if you uh, cover it with a bunch of smoke. Do you say? Um, do you say that story about the studio wanting to pull the church scene from? Um, yeah, called, which seems crazy. Fire? Yeah, it's like that's the only scene that everyone remembers about that movie. So. But also, how would that movie work without that? I have no idea. But anyway, it doesn't matter. They brought him back next movie anyway. So we're good. Yeah, like <laughs> do whatever you want. Um, but yeah, I, I I would not recommend going to see it in the cinema. You can just wait till it comes to Apple TV Plus. Probably Sold like me. three, four months. Um, you know, obviously, there's there's. 
there's a end credit scene and where it kind of makes hints at what could potentially be continued to the franchise. Will it be continued? Unlikely. I don't think this is going. This one's going anywhere. Uh, you know, just go back to the Kingsman. Make Kingsman three, please, Matthew Vaughn. Um, yeah. The other thing that threw me, and it's probably just a quirk, one quirk for me. At one point, Bryce Dallas Howard has blonde hair. It's very weird. I know she had blonde hair in Spider Man Three, but also it's I don't know. It just didn't work. It was very off putting for me in this trailer. Uh, or in this movie, so that's my feelings. I oh I don't know. Yeah, I feel like you know, it's this movie's kind of become everybody's punch mouth this week, so I don't want to say too much on it. Obviously, underperformed at the box office, but you know, again, this is like another movie that was it's for Apple TV. Uh, they just got a theatrical release, so uh, I don't know. It, and yeah, the weird cameos of like. John Cena and Ariana. Ariana Du Bois is, is probably the weirdest <laughs> one that gets introduced. Uh, the cat's really good, though. Yeah, cat's good. I'm back in. Back in. Uh, Dylan, you were able to go to the cinema this week. Finally, I feel like you haven't gone to the cinema in ages. Mm, possibly. And you watched The Iron Claw, a movie that I was not a big fan of. I really What'd liked it. I thought it was okay. great. I thought it was fantastic. Um, teared up at the end. Yeah, complete opposite of you. I got the complete yeah, opposite. Yeah, I'm a monster. <laughs> yeah, you are a monster. I I think Zac Efron in that final scene, oh, gut wrenching. Um, his delivery of I don't want to spoil it, but no, it was it was. I thought it was with his dad. No, with his kids. Oh, that's right. Yeah. That scene, I thought it was fucking insanely well done. The, the the kids just looking at him, I'm like, and this what he says, just the how he words was it? Yeah, I really am heartless. I completely five that. five words where he says, "I used to be a something," and well, that's what it is. Yeah, and I was like, that's fucking, that's yeah. Oh. Um, no, I really really liked it. I I think the, the important thing about the movie is obviously that it's not really a movie about wrestling. It's a it's just a movie about this family. Um, that mm-hmm. happens to to be wrestling, and I I think the movie does a really good job at keeping that at the the, the, the core. Forefront. Um, it's yeah, you, it's it's a movie. Like if you watch a trial, you're like, ah oh, man, I hate wrestling. WWE's dumb. It's like don't let that pers- not turn you off from watching it. It's it's the movie doesn't really spend too much time in the wrestling outside of what it really needs. So there's no extended wrestling scenes. I feel like they show obviously there's a cut, there's a little bit of wrestling here and there, but it's always just sort of to help push the story forward or key moments for p- particular characters, but they only show you wrestling matches that push forward the story. It's not like a Rocky film, you no. know, the Rocky, a lot of stories in the ring, you know, like that's, that's yeah. where it's happening. It's all We're, building up to that fight. This yeah, one, they're just, the fight. I think yeah. the most extensive one is probably the Harley race. Kenny one. Yeah. But other than that, everything is like cut to. Yeah. yeah. They want to show a bit more of that for a particular reason, I guess, which is the, is the thing but everyone else and i mean i went into this knowing the story like I, i'd watch that especially the, the the larger deep dive that dark side of the ring gives yeah. gives on the story i so i, I knew the, where we were going and it was still just like absolutely yeah it was it's still a lot for one family to go through um yeah i, I thought it was shot really really well i think everyone gives these really really fantastic performances like i don't think anyone's bad now i think everyone's like really, really zach Efron, um old mate from the bear and um jeremy on the one the, the good the dude from mine hunter um <laughs> those, <laughs> those three people cult yep yep something in particular I would say the standouts everyone else is really good as well I, I i think my only downside is and i don't know how to fix it it's just it is downside of the product which is the there's two female characters in it and they're just not characters or they're not like they're nothing you know his mum, and i guess it's like his mum is just portrayed i assume the way it was in reality which is just she's just sort of a shell by the end of it yeah and then but and they try to add a little bit with um uh what's that her name that billy actress. lily whatever yeah lily something collins the- collins lily collins tries to add something as um the wife uh, yeah. of um kevin's kevin um yeah kevin i think it's kenny right is that Kenny or Zach Efron, but he, uh, Zach Efron's wife, but she 
doesn't add a lot and she's she's there and it's fine but like that i think that's the the one downside the the two people who stand out to have like the least amount of anything at all to do with anything happening in this movie who and the only i i really feel like maybe they could have given a bit more to her in particular to show what she was going through mentally while he's like sleeping at uh, the gym during like the last act and mm -hmm. um, why he's doing that and maybe shown a bit more from her side I, I think it was a choice to focus entirely on the, the that like the family family but at that point I'm like well you're married in like you are part of the family like so maybe but they just want to focus on the boys the brothers and stuff so um, but otherwise I thought it was yeah I thought it was absolutely fantastic and you know I, I, I went down tempered down a little bit because you were like oh, I didn't think it was that great and I'm like I'm going in like okay maybe it's not as good as as all that and then at the end i'm sitting there tears running down going ash is just heartless oh <laughs> <laughs> uh, well you're welcome i guess <laughs> yeah, yeah uh yeah he's kevin yeah kevin, yeah kevin the eldest one um yeah i mean as someone who, who's a bit more familiar how do you feel about them not including the other brother and also kind of the condensed timeline i guess of some of the events i think it's fine the movie at the end of the day i know that pe if people want documentary you watch a documentary i don't yep. feel like any of the choices are bad per se no. i don't know like i guess the argument is it doesn't do justice to one of the brothers but you had you had one more character and how's that affect the the ability to to give these car like fully formed characters at a certain point you're like there's something i think what <laughs> One of those events happening is bad. Yeah. Two of them is like really bad. Yeah. But then three is a little bit ridiculous. Because did, did you look up the, because they basically combined two into yes. one character, which is, yes. um, uh, what'd you say his name was again from the bear? Je yeah. Jeremy Allen White. Jeremy he Allen plays White. plays Carrie. Carrie. Yeah. He takes on two characters. Basically. A little bit. Kind of. I feel like he, he takes on two major pieces Beats. of the family history beat in yeah. one character. So, but yeah, it is that thing of like, okay, well, if it was enough brother, like, I, I definitely feel like every brother had enough to them that they feel like fully formed characters. And if you had added one more, there would have been one that felt like a sidekick, which in reality there was, but yeah, I guess that's how it actually was, but yeah. yeah. Would feel weird in, in the actual film. So yeah. I would say also people were complaining that the um, Ric Flair actor was terrible. He was pretty terrible. So. <laughs> I was like, yeah, it was, a, it was, was a pretty bad Ric, Ric Flair impression. Pretty, so. yeah, pretty mediocre. Woo! <laughs> <laughs> Woo! <laughs> Woo. <laughs> All right, so that's the Iron Claw. Check it out, I guess, uh, if you actually have emotions. Uh, so we both have watched uh, at least a little bit of Mrs. and Mrs. Smith, the new series that came to Prime Video, uh, created by Francesca Sloan and Donald Glover. So it's inspired by uh, Mrs. and Mrs. Smith. The 2025 film uh, is how it's credited. Uh, it follows John and Jane, played by Donald Glover and Maya Erskine, as two new agents to this uh, company who, uh, at this company, they're, they abandon their identities they become jane and john smith uh a married couple and then they go on jobs together or assignments for the company um they're exclusively talk communicate to their handler or whoever's in charge through like a messenger app on their laptop uh who they re refer to as hi hi um and yeah it's just each episode is like a kind of different adventure i guess um, how many episodes in did you get, Dylan? Only one, so I'm not gonna Only one, okay. Here, so. Not because I didn't like it, just life. Well, other things I've... Priorities. Spent time with other things. And I was like, you can hopefully see this one through. Yes. So what do you think, at least, from the first episode? I really enjoyed the first episode. Uh, I guess if we're going to talk, talk a bit more spoilers, or only be the first one anyway. Um, I like the way the episode, first episode builds up, slower paced. Let them get to know each other. They're sort of sensing each other out. One of them's trying to figure out the real name of one. Um, Don Glover's character is definitely asking a lot more questions um, than the other one. Um, 
you know, they're like, what's our job? Do this. And then you have this big build up. They're like, oh, they're tracking this package. And then at the end of fucking, you know, like huge event happens. And you're like, okay. They're, even they're a bit like, holy there's shit. There's a misdirect. Yeah, there's so, definitely a huge misdirect. So, I, I, but I really enjoyed the slow pace up until that moment. So it wasn't like I was turned off by the slow pace. I, th- I thought that was, that was quite uh, relieving to actually have a slow pace show like this. Like the chemistry is really good between both of them and all the little chit chat and stuff. They go in the movie theater. That was the only part that pissed me off because they're talking in the theater, but otherwise. It's a live <laughs> No, it, it was bad. Why wasn't you talking? You could have just yeah. texted. Yeah, just. just well, actually, was well, she wasn't talking. She was on her phone. That was the issue. Yeah, she was literally on her phone talking in the cinema. It was fucking. Well, she wa- she wasn't talking. She was texting. I don't give a fuck. No, I'm just saying she wasn't doing both terrible sins. She was only doing one. Yeah. Well. <laughs> she was listening and texting. She was on the job. What are you going to do? Um. Yeah, I finished the season. It's fantastic. Um, it's really, it's really interesting because when I went in and like from the first few episodes, I'm like, oh, it's just going to be like them working on like a different mission each time, getting to know each other. Um, but it becomes much more than that. Like their relationship progresses reasonably quickly. Um, but then it also becomes very realistic in a regard where like they're having struggles of like, because their work life and their personal life are so closely intertwined, they're I mean, both they... struggling to deal with quick, that. Quick question, because I didn't know. Did they, ahead of time, had they revealed Alexander Skarsgård and whatever her name is, I forgot. They where... listed Alan's, Alexander Skarsgård and I think it's Isa Gonzalez. Yeah, that one. Yeah, yeah. yeah. As cast members. As, as people in the cast. Right, okay, yeah. Because like they are, their prologue scene definitely sets up the where you assume these characters are going to go with their relationship. Because in that opening scene, you, you, it tells you enough within that opening scene that you're like, well, these are two, these are like our spies, but they've grown too attached to each other. Potentially, potentially. Um, yeah, it's really interesting. So like them, it, it feels very naturalistic and that kind of stuff. It definitely has, uh, elements of Atlanta. You know, like the very naturalistic talking and like the way the camera just kind of lingers and there's it every moment does not to be need to be filled and it's like funny but it doesn't need to be funny every single moment it's not like constantly needing to play for laughs and that kind of stuff it just you know when there's a joke there they take it and that kind of stuff um i think you know donald glover myers can have fantastic chemistry and the season really builds up into an interesting way um to the concluding episode which kind of i feel like delivers what people may have been expecting going into the series um so yeah i think it's really good i'm excited i want you to watch the rest of it so we can talk about it um i'm hopeful they do another season but if this is all we get that's cool too is what i'll say um paul dano it's fantastic. He plays the neighbor who is kind of off in a way. And it is like a really fantastic like payoff to his kind of involvement. Um, there's so many questions about like the company that they're working for and that kind of stuff. Um, a lot of mystery. Um, some of it paid off, some of it not paid off. Um, but yeah, it's just a really interesting kind of spy world that they've kind of built here. Um, and you, yeah, you only get to see kind of snippets of their life and that kind of stuff obviously they talk about other missions they've gone on in between episodes and that kind of stuff so um yeah mrs mrs smith it's really really good uh you know check it out on prime video so i finished watching percy jackson and the olympians was a, a disney plus series based on the beloved series of books by rick rawdon um obviously that was turned into a movie like a decade ago, that nobody, all the fans despised. Um, Wasn't there two movies? There were two movies. Surprise, yeah. This, I guess the first movie was successful enough, despite the fan hate, that they decided to make a second movie. Uh, and then they just made the fans even more angry. Uh, yeah, really good. Like, it's a really fantastic, you know, teen, young adult show. Um, really good characters, like, Percy, the show is kind of 
centered on the three kids and they've got fantastic chemistry and like rapport and that kind of stuff and they really bounce off each other really well obviously you've got the mythology of the greek mythology that's tied in on the backdrop and that kind of stuff um visually it looks really good i didn't realize until uh, i watched the behind the scenes uh documentary they released as well a lot of the a lot of it was shot in the volume um or like a lot of <laughs> A lot of segments of it were shot in the volume. Like, there, there's some real sets, uh, including a casino that they built in like a abandoned mall or whatever. Um, but you know, like for some fantastical settings, it's shot in the volume and that kind of stuff, uh, and that looks really good. Um, yeah, I mean, it's just it's so reliant on these kids, and they they just kind of deliver uh, in spades. Um, of course, it's like one of the last performances of Lance Reddick, who shows up for a bit as Zeus. Um, he's good. Uh, yeah, I, I mean, it, it's a show I got more invested in as it went along. I wanted to watch the episodes as soon as they came out. Um, very enjoyable um, story. Uh, very important story for a lot of kids and like the story about uh, this kid who's got like a elements of age adhd well originally so what i've learned since is that rick rodin wrote was percy jackson originated as like stories he would tell his son who was dealing with adhd and dyslexia um at bedtime to like make him feel better about you know create a hero with the same sort of issues that he was doing with and then he wrote the book and then it became like a big phenomenon and that kind of stuff um so yeah i think it's really good everybody should check it out Percy Jackson and the Olympians. Um, it's a good time. Uh, and then I also finished watching Monarch Legacy of Monsters, which is the Apple TV Plus series uh, set in the world of Godzilla, uh, specifically set after the events of <laughs> Godzilla, uh, the 2014 film. Um, it follows... Uh, a bunch of people who get intertwined with Monarch, the the group that's kind of been tracking Kaiju uh, since the World War II. Um, yeah, I can't remember where I, I talked about it previously. Finally got around to watching the rest of it. Um, they, uh, I mean, it's, it's a solid binge. <laughs> There's a lot of interesting characters and like a kind of interweaving of a bunch of stories and like obviously they're telling the story in kind of a non-linear well they're telling this the story of the events coming happening at the time and there's a lot of flashbacks to previous events and like kind of explaining how different characters got to where they were um yeah and kind of explaining how monarch became this curve covert ex- uh, organization despite uh them wanting to initially be like kind of study and uh you know uh examine kaiju rather than like kind of destroy them <laughs> and how that kind of turns uh into like a more military based organization and that kind of stuff um yeah the cast is really good uh kurt russell is a lot of fun um the the monsters look very good especially for tv um you know they don't glow purple so i mean i'm sure that makes people happy uh i don't know how tightly it like fits into the canon like there's certain elements it's like, very tight i'm saying i watched two episodes john goodman's in it it's fucking tight i mean it, there's a tie into john goodman that i didn't get till the first till the final episode um but that was probably because it turns out Anders Holm the guy from Workaholics mm. is playing a young John Goodman. <laughs> I didn't realize that until the last episode. Even though it's probably more explicitly explained. I'm sure they his name. So. <laughs> he says that they have the exact same name. Yeah. yeah but who remembers John Goodman's character in Kong Skull of Island? What was his name? Hey, John Goodman. Well, you don't remember the character name. No one remembers the character's name if John Exactly. Goodman's so how would you... Go, no. It's John Goodman. Uh, but yeah, I mean, if you enjoy <laughs> these, the Godzilla stuff, I mean, you know, it ties in. Uh, <laughs> That's such a glowing endorsement. If you enjoy <laughs> the Godzilla stuff, it ties in. I mean, I think it's better than Godzilla Big Kong or whatever it was called. 
last movie. I mean, I don't like any of the really any of those movies. So well, I don't think you're gonna enjoy this at all. Probably, you know, unless you want to deal with I mean, family I, I, trauma. I, but I, I watched the first two episodes. I didn't mind it because it's a lot slower, slower paced. Slow paced. It's 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 more about the characters again yeah. rather than actual kaiju and like yeah. just the you know them tangentially being involved. You know, mm. there's a lot of double crossing and like that kind of stuff. So normal TV sh- yeah, I can, I can stuff. Godzilla vs Kong and all that just gets a bit ridiculous. Yeah. All right. Uh, let's move into the mandatory Netflix segment of the show. Uh, you've watched two Academy Award nominated films this week. Yeah. Uh, talk to me about Society of the Snow. Society of the Snow is a true story about the seventies. I think it is. Crash, uh, what are they? I can't remember. The Uguan, Uga- Ugandan? I think that's, yeah, I think that's right. Uruguayan? Uh, what? Uruguayan? Yeah, but I think it's like, isn't it like the plural Ugandan? No? Anyway, no. we'll go with what I'm saying. Um, the They are, so it's a rugby team and a few people, they're flying on this plane. They're going from wherever, wherever the country, whatever, we're trying to work out where they are. And they're trying to go to Chile. I can remember that because mm-hmm. they say Chile a, a lot in the film. Uh, and then the plane crashes and then in the middle of f- fuck nowhere and it's snowing and it's cold and it sucks and a lot of people die in the initial crash and then they're stuck out there for months uh, is basically a true story. Um, they, it turns out, I never, I've never watched it, but after watching it, it turns out they did a movie in the 90s that starred... Um, um, fucking hawk what's his uh ethan hawk or ethan hawk fuck i'm having the day i'll tell you what uh the ethan hawk started it. i never watched that one so um but that was a hollywood interpretation and by what i read about it they made a lot of uh they didn't they they alive they, that's it they, they swayed, remember, they swayed away from stuff buddy mentioning it yeah okay. directed by frank marshall yeah frank marshall that was it yeah so they apparently change a lot more than that. This is, uh, but everything I read, other than one choice at the end of the movie, this is pretty much from all accounts, from survivors and stuff, pretty much how it went down. The only thing they change is like the amount of helicopters that turn up at the end or some shit like that. Or no, they change the 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 fact they have to stay an extra night when they didn't. They uh, in real life they had to stay an extra night, but in this they just like speed up, which I'm like in the turn, it's fine. Um, it's a very slow like well not slow it's a very it's like two and a half hours or something like that and it is i mean it's not something you'd want to watch if you want to feel good about life i guess it's two and a half <laughs> hours of mostly well it takes about 20 minutes to get into the crash i think they show you a bit like they, they get you give you a little bit of time to get to know the characters and the key people i guess um then they get in the plane the plane crash is quite um not gory but uh just yeah it it just frush you into that like how it would happen and you know the chairs i'll fly for and people are crushed and bones are broken straight away and a bunch of people die and you know it sh- shows you the impact and how it would have i guess how they assume it went down um and everything um but then then they get there they try and work out how to escape and but the main thing and the thing they didn't talk about for ages in the, the news stories and stuff for ages is they they turned to cannibalism to survive so but the the, the thing does a and i this isn't a horror movie you don't there's no um they don't show gory stuff or whatever. They just like you see people eating stuff, but it's not it's not done in a way that's meant to be disgusting. That you can tell that the film uh, and the director J. A. Bayona, Bayona, you can tell that he the idea was to just show it as like it. This is what happened. They chose to survive. The people that died. Um, and then they chose to feed off the people that died to survive. Um, it was, it's not done in a way that's meant to disgust the audience. You can tell there's been a purposeful choice made that it is not done in a way that it's um, uh, meant to make anyone in the audience feel like this is disgusting or bad or anything. You're meant to morally question it as the characters do. And if it's okay and all these sorts of things, and the film wants, uh, has like a discussion around that, um, but it's not meant to, it's ideally, I think by the end of it, you're supposed to, and I think as the characters sort of come to like, you know, in death, their friends found a way for them to survive, I guess, is the, 
is the way that the messaging sort of goes and stuff. So um, I found it super interesting. It's beautifully shot. It's sort of horrible that so much of this movie, which they apparently shot a bunch in location and everything, um, how stunning the the vistas are and the, the shots they get out there in this, this white snow and everything like that. Some really wonderful long landscapes and, and the everything like that. Beautiful. And at the same time, you've got a fucking, like, it'll be like this huge, beautiful shot. You're like, mountains. Oh, look at those pretty stuff. And then you'll be like, and then you'll see, like, the the half the plane that they're all, like, sleeping in every night. Then they're like, yeah, but if I just ignore that, this is a beautiful image. Like, <laughs> <laughs> uh, but yeah, I, I, I enjoyed it. I thought it was, uh, it, was, it was good. It was good. All right. Uh, then you also watched Rustin, starring Coleman Domingo. Uh, yeah, so Rustin is a person I never heard of. I'm not afraid to admit, admit which I guess is part of the, the, the movie. But So Bay- Bayard Rustin was a person who heavily involved in the social, political landscape in the 60s, 70s, or 50s, 60s, 70s, I guess, uh, in particular in the lead up to the 1963 March on Washington, where, of course, everyone most famously knows about um, Dr. Martin Luther King's speech, which is the most famous part from that event. However, Bayard Rustin is the person who organized and got that march and that rally and everything was his idea. Like that's the, it's not meant to take, the film isn't obviously meant to take anything away from King. It is definitely a, hey, there was more than one person involved in that event. And this is, the the movie doesn't even do a whole, like, it's only this one person. Again, they're not trying to go, not this person, but this person. But the film definitely does also a good job at showing all the people that were involved in the, it comes together in a very quick, like comes together in like six, eight weeks or something like that. Uh, from like let's do this to, to let's get it going it's like how the fuck do these people organize the amount of people the amount of um the buses they organize thousands of buses to bring people in from other states and stuff into washington to to do this event um what they went through with the cops and the um the political enemies i guess if you want to call them that um who sort of start teasing and then eventually leaking details about rustin's uh private life which in which he's a he's a gay man and obviously 60s that's uh that would have been you know that's uh i more horribly kept secret than it, uh, it needed to be but that was the 60s uh some really good performances in it uh chris rock plays an absolute asshole but he goes good job at it um the person who plays martin luther king is really good uh jeffrey wright plays a fuckhead but he was really good at it um solid coleman domingo is definitely the standout his performance is fantastic uh the the film is pretty i guess formulaic for this type this genre you know like this sort of feel good biography type of thing it doesn't do a lot to explore any and all potential negatives or elements of this character it's very much a movie that's like this is guy he was great like that which is fine um, but it does play a little bit paint by numbers for for a lot of it but yeah coleman domingo as talked about a few times highly maybe not so much anymore he's definitely come around a few years ago i was like fucking hugely underrated actor at the time would see him in a lot of things and just constantly feel like no one was talking about how good he is and everything he's in but yeah obviously sort of we're getting around to that with him getting a nomination and everything so uh yeah would suggest watching it just for his performance alone all right uh and then i watched uh the greatest night in pop which is a documentary about the making of the renowned pop song we are the world which obviously was a massive uh collaboration between some of the biggest artists of the 80s um led by michael jackson and lionel richie uh who wrote the song um this documentary kind of you know documents how that song came to be how they plans to to do this like starts with uh who was it harry bella no yeah harry belafonte um you know reaching out to lionel richie's manager uh, about wanting to write a song release a song in the same way that band-aid was doing for uh, a charity uh over in the uk do something here in the us um 
So they decide to bring like a group of people together to perform this massive song and release it to raise money and that kind of stuff. Um, so yeah. Uh, so the only way they could get all the artists to be at the same place at the same time is to have the recording session after the American Music Awards. So everybody's coming to LA for the American Music Awards. Uh, and after the show, they all go to the studio uh, and try to perform, do this song that none of them have really sung before um, all together. Um, and they're drunk. Some one of them in particular is in the celebratory mood, and he's drinking during the process, um, to the extent where they're like, "Oh, we need to hurry up and get him to sing his bit before he can't sing anymore." <laughs> um, yeah, really interesting because obviously there's a like a who's who of people involved, like uh, listed in starring as Lionel Richie, Michael Jackson, Stevie Wonder, Diana Ross, Tina Turner, Bruce Springsteen, Huey Lewis. Cindy Lauper, Sheila E, Diane Baldrick. Um, they got a bunch of these people to come and do interviews uh, and that kind of stuff. Obviously, Lionel Rinchy being like a leading person. And it's really, it's really interesting listening to him talk of like the process because he, like, he would, he obviously was a uh, lead singer of the Commodores. Michael Jackson was the lead singer of the, the Jackson 5. And they kind of had a friendship because of that similar kind of position and that kind of thing. Um, so they start writing the song at, uh, Michael Jackson's house. Um, and Michael Jackson obviously had a lot of animals <laughs> around. So at one point his bird, his parrot that can talk is fighting with the dog and like yelling at him to shut up or something is very confusing. And then, um, my favorite moment, the line when she describes is he's sitting, he's w- sitting there and then he hears, uh, a bunch of albums get knocked over. And then Michael Jackson's snake comes out. <laughs> it's like this this house of horrors, really, uh, in one way. Uh, that Lionel Richie found himself in and wanted to get out of as quickly as possible. Um, but yeah, really interesting kind of... It's interesting, like, none of this footage has been seen before other than, like, the actual footage they used in the video to of them singing the song. Um, really interesting, because, like, Quincy probably... You know, Quincy Jones, this producer, like one of the th- key things he did before they started working is like at the entrance to the studio, he put up a sign saying, check your egos at the door because everybody in this room is like a pretty big star. Um, and like, it's really interesting kind of seeing him try to wrangle everybody into doing their thing. And like at a certain point, like Stevie Wonder's like, oh, we should have some African words in this song. Uh, you know, we should change the lyrics and that kind of stuff. To the extent they're like one, I guess he was a country singer. He's like, I'm out. <laughs> I'm leaving. I think the quote is, no old boy had speaks quite Swahili. <laughs> no, so. Uh, yeah, really interesting. Like, obviously, you know, lots of famous people and them like dealing with trying to do this thing in such a short period of time and like they don't finish the recording the song till like six o'clock in the morning um yeah and there's like interesting tidbits like uh Sheila E um was like the percussionist for Prince and she kind of feels like the only reason she was involved is because they wanted Prince to come be a part of this and she was like kind of the bait to get him to to come in um so that's a little bit messed up but uh obviously massive song uh massive hit really interesting documentary uh so yeah check that out on netflix all right that's everything in our watch history let's move into a bit of film news and the big news this week netflix has kind of released their slate for 2024 uh so we're going to cover that in this week's top three definitely in the top three so this week's top three is top three netflix projects announced for 2024 uh, so yeah, they released a whole bunch of stuff over on Tadam, including a What's Next trailer, uh, listing a bunch of stuff coming in 2024. So we did this last year with their stuff in 2023. Do you want to guess what our top top three yeah. things were? I don't think I could even... No. So I, listen, I just listened back before recording this. Okay. Your number three, Chicken Run. Disappointed. That was not very good. My number three was Nimona. I'm happy with that. Okay, that's fair. Yep. And then our ones and twos were switched. Okay. 
your number two and my number one was uh shit. <laughs> the name of it is Escape Me Right in This Moment. The Zack Snyder Oh Rebel uh, Moon. Rebel Moon. Was that your number one or my number? That was my number one and your number two? Yeah. Neither of us have watched it. <laughs> nope. <laughs> and my number two and your number one. David Finch is the killer. I mean, that was both, good. That was we both enjoyed. We both so. enjoyed that. All right, so you know, you were two, you were two so, or three, yeah. and I was one out of three. Then, yes. So, Dylan, what is your number three this year? My number three is fucking stay open the phone. Uh, my number three is Hitman, Richard uh, Linklater's newest movie, uh, starring what's his name, Glenn. Glenn Powell. Glenn Powell. Uh, I don't. They haven't released much of a trailer so far. It's a. It's a. It's a. It's a cop. No. It's a. It's a. What's he? He's hitman. not a hitman. He's a. But he's not a hitman. He's a. He's like something else, right? Isn't that the whole thing? I don't think he's a hitman. Okay. But I thought isn't the pitch like he's he's a guy who discovers he's good at being a hitman, even though he's not like a hitman at first. I don't know. There's something. There's some like comedic. Hit Sounds thing. like him and me. <laughs> no, I said. Well, here's the description: a professor moonlighting as a hitman. Yeah, so he's a professor in the day, oh. and at night he's a hitman, right? Um, yeah. So there's a, he's like, he's got a double double life sort of thing going on. Um, anyway, it's based on a true story, which is love a wild part. Um, so it doesn't seem like it could be. So then it's written by Richard Linklater and Glenn Powell. And then stars yep. Glenn Powell and Rich, 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 Richard Linklater as well. Uh, but yeah, the trailer we've got so far, very tantalizing. It looks like it'll be funny action comedy sort of time. Um, not the sort of movie you'd, you'd obviously expect out of Linklater. No. But he is also a director who's proved consistently time and time again that he's able to expand and go into different uh, genres outside of what, he's, uh, what you would consider his normality to be. So um, I think... It has the potential to be super fun, um, and I usually like a Linklater film. So, anytime a Linklater film release is probably going to be something I'm looking forward to. All right. Uh, my number three is the new Studio Ponic film, uh, The Imaginary. This is my number uh, two. Okay, so uh, Studio Ponic obviously did Mary and the Witch, uh, and a lot of ex uh, Studio Ghibli people. Um, so yeah, them doing their own individual thing. This is the first like proper film, like full feature they've done since mm. Mary and the Witch. Um, uh, their last like 2012 or some shit like that. Too. Yeah, the last one was uh, like an anthology film, uh, Modest Heroes, which also released on Netflix. Um, so this one is more, you know, a feature. <laughs> Uh, for what's the description? Studio, the imaginary portrays the depths of humanity and creativity through the eyes of young Amanda, her imaginary companion Rudga. Their fantastical adventures launched from an attic lead them to discover a magical world of creatures and places never before seen until a sinister force threatens to destroy the imaginary world and the friendship within it. Uh, based on what images I've seen, like it definitely it looks, looks like different. It, it <laughs> no, it doesn't. I don't think it does. I think it, it looks more storybooky, like yeah, true, and just maybe the color palette and like the hard lines are not there. Yeah, in the, in the same way in the studio. I would put it this way: looking at the screenshot now, the characters' emotions and the framing and the the every, that looks like Ghibli ins inspiration to me. But yeah, the stuff you're actually saying about the hard lines and like the the general the way the characters are drawn outside of there the way they're emoting doesn't look like Ghibli. So the framework, I guess, the the skeleton side mm. of it, it feels like that's carrying on that the, the Ghibli inspiration, the, the the history of the people involved and stuff, like that sort of stuff. Yeah. Well, maybe that's just Japanese animation, I guess, but um, outside of that, no. Mm. Like, you look at a poster, it looks like a fucking anime film. Yeah. So. So, yeah. That's your number two as well. Yeah, anything Sugar else? Cane, I, was, I, I, not that I, was, I didn't love uh, the witch and whatever it's called, but um, I thought it was good. Um, came for this just because the studio and talent involved and um, looks 
just looks looks good. I don't know it looks good. Like I'm just I'm just going off talent, I guess, like pedigree. Hmm. Uh, so my number two then is Unfrosted, the Pop Tart story. Uh, something we know that's been in the works for a while. It's directed by Jerry Seinfeld, starring Jerry Seinfeld, about the creation of Pop Tarts, which seems like a crazy idea uh, for a film. Uh, but you know, apparent the logline is Michigan, 1963. Kellogg's and Post, sworn cereal rivals, race to create a pastry that will change the face of breakfast. A tale of ambition, betrayal, sugar, and menacing milkmen. Uh, yeah, really good cast of people, including Melissa McCarthy, Jim Gaffigan, Hugh Grant, Max Greenfield, Christian Slater, Bill Burr, Daniel Levy, James Marsden, Jack McBrayer, uh, and more. You know, so uh, it looks like it'll be a fun time. And you know, have you had pop tarts before? I think I have. To be honest, have you? I have. Yeah. What are they? They're like? solid. I mean, they're they're like biscuits with filling in them. I guess sounds like a biscuit like a, to me. Yeah, what, but you warm it up and it tastes makes... it's like mm, like a biscuit kind of pastry. I guess I don't know. Could you ever think of like a different part of the world where, like, if if you say pop tart, if anyone says pop tart, I I can picture them because I've seen them in movies. Yeah, I know exactly what they are, and yet I don't. If you know what I mean. Yeah, because I've never had them, but. It's just because it's so we're so like infatuated with American culture and the rest of the world, and like the American cinema rules the rest of the world. Like, I guarantee you could go to Japan or wherever, and I bet you it's like Pop Tart. I know what that is. Fucking East India, they're like Pop Tart. I know what that is. Yeah, crazy. Interesting. What's your number one? My number one is Arcane season two. Okay. <laughs> uh, not yours. Well, no, I, I'm. I'm sure. I went for stuff that, you know, isn't a given. <laughs> oh. That's fine. Is it though? Why are we excited for Arcane Season 2? Arcane Season 1 was one of the best things released in whenever it released a couple of years ago, and um, I can't wait for it to continue. It's It was shocking how good it was. Um, it sort of started a whole new fandom that for people who don't really care too much about League of Legends and everything, um, and I can't believe that they've done such a well-produced, character driven show like this off what it's based on because the characters in league of legends have a cool backstory and everything like that but the fact that they made this so that first season so emotional and well and like added so much to it i i don't know it was just shocking how well that show was um and this i think given how the, the first season had like a slow bit like word of mouth to it i think i think arcane season two has the potential to be like netflix's biggest thing of the year TV show were. Potentially. Everybody loves their League of Legends. Yep. My number one is they've listed it as Untitled Mike Sher Ted Danson comedy series. But it's the Mole Agent adaptation. What so the Mole, Mole Agent, Agent was a 2021 Academy Award nominated documentary. Uh, and it's being adapted into a comedy series. So it follows a retired man who gets a new lease on life when he answers an ad from P.I. and becomes a mole in a secret investigation. So I'm pretty sure from memory, uh, similar concepts, uh, the mole, a, the, a P.I. hires someone to go inside a nursing home to like, to like uncover like some sort of mystery there. And, and like report home. back to him. A nursing home. Sure. So that's why they've hired Ted Danson. Because he's an old man. <laughs> he's got it the would pace. make sense in a nursing home. Pace for it, yeah. Yeah. So, you know, like, I'm no a big Mark Scher fan. No role other than you, Dan. Yeah. Big Mark Scher fan. Uh, enjoyed Ted Danson. Uh, so this looks like it'll be a very fun time. So, yeah. What do you think of all this Netflix stuff for this year? Scrolling for a list. I wasn't that um, not that impressed. I think I think this year didn't have any big name creators involved. Mm. I would say. See, like I'm scrolling through and I'm like, okay, like here's a random movie of like Haley Berry in it. Here's another random movie of Haley Berry in it. Here's like some random Taron Egerton thing. Like I would say most of the the movie side stuff. It was all the docos that looked more interesting. Some of the TV shows look cool and whatever else, but. I, yeah, I wouldn't say I was super 
like oh man netflix is killing it like this year that their, their, their schedule stacked yo yeah i mean you know maybe they'll pick some up stuff up through the year or like there's some stuff that they're not ready to announce but uh there's no you know david fincher film or you know any big name director maybe we just got you look at that list and you're like there doesn't seem to be an academy award Mm. (laughs) nominee here and they've got a few things nominated this year so i don't know yeah so i mean we could be surprised by any of the year but Mm. um yeah it's interesting because obviously this is also going to be well i don't think it's this year but soon they've the person who was in charge of film at netflix has left Mm. um so you know things could be about to change in that regard in Netflix. Uh, even I think the new person came out and specifically said, we're are not interested in the theatrical experience or our people want to see movies on Netflix. Mm-hmm. Um, so we might be leaning away from like big. Uh... Did you just side note? Just cool. Did you see prestige films? <laughs> this someone on Twitter today posted, shared around this clip of Matt Damon from hot ones that I should, must have been older, but no. I haven't seen it before. Because I don't think Matt Damon would be on Hot Ones recently. Like, it's all about um Sydney Sweeney was on it recently. Yes. Um, but in this clip, he gets asked about, you know, why doesn't... It's a very well done clip, and it's... I, I think the person I saw quite retweet it was... Said something like, it's so funny that Matt Damon says something so poignant, like, well done, while dying at the same time because he's obviously having the <laughs> the hot wings but the clip is basically him talking about how movies and um at the time he's talking uh, in the clip he talks about um i can't remember the something something calibre or what calibre or whatever it was the, the the film that went straight to uh uh it went straight to like foxtel or whatever like years ago like 2010 or something like that this pride hg max and shit but he's like talking about it's like okay well i got 25 million 25 million to make the movie and then you get told okay well you need to double that for the marketing which is a a common thing if you pay attention to the film industry they always get they always tell Mm -hmm. you like to take your what if you're spending and you know double it so then you've got half of the marketing so he's like i got 25 million to make the movie i got 25 million to um, market the movie and then he's like starts adding on these things and he's like now i gotta pay these people i gotta i gotta split the cost of the cinemas blah 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 he's like oh some my 25 million dollar movies 100 million and he's like and back in the 90s when i used to make a lot of movies like this uh like character driven drama sort of things um he's like you wouldn't make it on the cinema you'd make a decent chunk but then you'd get that second wave you know you'd release it on home video you'd get that suck, second chunk of change so you knew even if you didn't make your 100 million back or whatever um there was always a chance going there he's like these days because there's no second life no second revenue stream cinemas just will not take or movie studios will not take risks on movies like this anymore because there's no there's no second life. It's like they either do you yeah. either do well at the cinema or mm. nothing. And it was just like when you hear it's not like new information, like I know this and you would know this, but yeah, I think hearing someone say it, and I guess for a lot of people, if the clip is going around, maybe that helps to explain why, you know, you're not getting a get lot of cinema. why cinema and big movie studios are super safe now with what they pick to produce and stuff, because it is solely your movie makes the money at the cinema. It goes to streaming service, but that money don't mean shit. It is the cinema money only. And they've got to split whatever you're taking with the cinema chains. You know? So yep. it's like your movie makes 200 million. Did it make 200 million? Cost 150 million. Have they made it back? I don't know. Can yeah. they make money on Blu-rays? No, nope, Disney doesn't even put out Blu-rays anymore. You know, like okay. it's, it's fucked. <laughs> it's absolutely it's fucked. Right. Well, you get the, the rental sales still. <laughs> but, you know. That probably doesn't compare at all to what the the Blu-ray sales used to be. Yeah, the, the home video market would have been would have been massive. Like, yeah, I can't. Even, yeah. All right, Dylan. Every single week, there's just so many new projects, and casting news announced. We can't cover it all, so we like to cover it in a segment we like to call "Would You Want to Invest," in which I list a bunch of projects. Uh, with varying amounts of information and dylan tells me if you would like to partially invest not invest or fully invest and then history will be the judge of whether he is right or wrong when do i when i get my next update like on i feel like we've done these for a while like when's my uh, i'll go even, through you, 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 you uh, doing like halfly or yearly or like what's it's the, whenever there is no enough? news <laughs> yeah i feel like surely it would have been i feel like oh i'll 
I'll do an update soon in the next couple of weeks. It's just a matter of keeping track of everything. I just want to know how much money I've got here, you know? Probably nothing. Uh, (laughs) Here's a good tie-in. Following... Oh, I'm reading all these from Deadline, by the way. Uh, Because I'm Matt Damon in it? Following the success of Air, Matt Damon and Ben Affleck are reuniting again on a kidnapping thriller, Animals, with Damon starring and Affleck directing. Uh, Conan McIntyre penned the script with revisions by Billy Ray. The film will be produced by Affleck, Damon, and Danny Burnland of Artist Equity, and Brad Weston and Colin Crichton of Make Ready. Uh, plot details are vague outside of it involving a kidnapping. Uh, pretty much this one's coming to Netflix, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> I couldn't find a good run-on sentence to any of it. <laughs> to mention Netflix, but yes, it's coming to Netflix. So I just looked it up, right? So Air yes. cost apparently 70 to $90 million to make. Made ninety million at the box office, then went to streaming Prime Video. So it made I had to make all its money in the box office, and then Prime Video, they you know who knows mm-hmm. how they work and how much it makes there. But if you if they're saying it costs seventy to ninety million, let's round off. Let's say it made let's round the middle eighty million, forty million to make that movie, and then forty million was marketing. Marketing, it's yeah. fucking crazy. And then take the rest of the fees out. No wonder. Anyway, uh, yeah, I'll fully invest. I'll, I'll go for a Ben Affleck Matt Damon project any day of the week. All right. Tim Robinson, Paul Rudd, and Kate Mara are set to star in Friendship, a new comedy from Fifth Season and Boulder Light Pictures. Uh, the pick centers on Craig Waterman, who enjoys his life. He likes New Balance shoes, Subway sandwiches, and Marvel movies. He lives in the suburbs with his wife Tammy and son Stephen. He's happy to work at Universal Digital, a company that helps brands make their products more habit-forming. Craig sees no reason to change anything or make new friends. Until weatherman Brian moves into the neighborhood. Mysterious and friendly, macho and vulnerable, Brian transforms everything for Craig. But Craig's obsessive and childlike nature threatens to ruin the friendship and possibly everything else in his life. I'm going to fully invest because it's got a a character named Craig Waterman. Craig Waterman. Yep. What name? Sure, why not? (laughs) After blowing audiences away with the hit extraction films at Netflix... Director Sam Hargrave has found his next high-octane vehicle. Sources tell Deadline he is set to direct an adaptation of Kill Them All for Paramount Pictures based on the popular graphic novel by Carl M. Starks. Uh, The graphic novel follows an elite female assassin who finds out that she's going to be terminated by the criminal syndicate she's been loyal to and decides to take them out first. Joining forces with a hard-drinking ex-cop, she embarks on a relentless, action-packed assault through 15 floors of the syndicate's headquarters, their ultimate target, the boss, who she has a complicated past with. Sounds like the plot of an 80s video game, you know? Um, I'll fully invest. I feel like, yeah, I haven't watched those instruction things, but obviously they're successful. So They're successful. Yeah. I've actually read this graphic novel. It's good, so I'm yeah. keen for this. Yeah. Very short, but, you know, fun. Turn into a three, eight, two and a half hour movie. Paramount has acquired Novocaine, an action film with franchise potential that will star Jack Quaid and Amber Midthunder, who was a revelation in Predator spin-off Prey. Uh, Robert Olsen and Dan Burke are directing a Lars Jacobson script. Uh, Quaid will play a sheltered blank exec. Quaid will play a sheltered bank executive called Nathan Kane, who has a rare genetic condition that prevents him from feeling physical pain when he is enduring it. When his bank is robbed and one of his co-workers kidnapped, he has to act and find his greatest liability becomes his greatest strength. I'm sorry, but how is Prey a spin-off? Like, it's literally just another Predator film. That's that's dumb. Well, um, I mean, it's not a direct sequel. <laughs> that's... It's, it's a fucking Predator. Like, there's a Predator trying to kill people. Anyway, that's dumb. Um, but also... Um, I don't know. Would you call Alien vs. Predator a spinoff? Yeah, that's 100% a spinoff. It's fucking two franchises versing one another. What are you talking about? <laughs> what the fuck is that? That's not at all the same like Prey. What I the fuck know. are you talking about? But it's I- still got a freaking Predator in it fighting. Yeah, it's Alien vs. Predator, right? Street Fighter versus fucking Tekken. Are they Tekken 8 or Tekken 9? You know, like, it's not. It's a spin-off. It's a fucking comic. What are you talking about? Prey's just a Predator movie. It's a Predator trying to kill people. It's a Predator movie. It's set in movie. the past. It's set in the past. It's, oh, that's why it's a spin-off. It's in the pa- you fucking... 
Everyone's like, oh, it's a spinoff. We can't count as a proper, even though it's better than the last like two, three Predator movies. Fucking Shane Black getting out of here, making his shit. I'm sorry that Deadline described it as a spinoff. I, I think you should be, because you read that, and the, I forgot what movie you're talking about. It distracted me so much. What was the movie I'm talking about? Novi Kane. Jack Quaid plays a guy who can't get hurt or doesn't oh, feel yeah, pain. Oh, yeah, partial invest. That's not his okay. superhero power, though. Like, he's not actually a superhero in the boys, but sure. No. Uh, Pamela Anderson, Jamie Lee Curtis, Dave Bautista, Brenda Song, Kernan Shipka, and <laughs> Billy Lord are starring in The Last Showgirl, directed by Gia Coppola. Uh, Kate Gertzden penned the script with Robert Schwartzman and Natalie Ferry producing. Uh, the film follows a seasoned showgirl who must plan for a future when her show abruptly closes after a 30-year run. As a dancer in her 50s, she struggles with what to do next. As a mother, she strives to repair a strained relationship with her daughter, who often took a backseat in her showgirl family. Um, for a second there, I was like, you were just, you're just reading out names, right? <laughs> like, I was for a bit. There was a lot of names. Yeah, I mean that's great. Who who the fuck is Geo Coppola? Like, is that is that a Coppola I don't know about? Oh niece. yeah, shoot. It's a niece, the niece of Sophia Sophia Coppola. Featured films: The Last Show Girl. She did Palo Alto. Palo Alto, right? Okay, I haven't watched that actually. So okay, um, that was the part that got me. Like, mainstream. Ooh. You saw Mainstream, right? Did With I? Andrew Garfield, my hawk. What's it about? Maybe you didn't. No, I don't think I have. So I haven't watched any of these films. So that would explain why I don't know who the person is. But yeah, when you said Coppola, Coppola, I was like, how's this relative? Um, Coppola is the only child of film producer Gian Coppola. Oh, okay, yeah, because he died in like the 80s. Right, okay. Um, I will... I keep getting distracted. You keep saying things that It's are... fine. That's what this podcast is. I'm getting... I'm getting film knowledge out to the people, I feel like, is what I'm saying. Like, I I, I, like, no. I ask a question, I seek the answer myself, and then I, I share what I've I've learned with the listeners. What the fuck was the... Pamela Anderson, right. Okay, I'm going to... Now, is this connected to the original? Like, is... No. is What original? Like, just the film Showgirls. No. Sure. It's about a showgirl. Just a But it's showgirl. not connected to Showgirls. Okay. Um, you know, fuck it. I'll fully invest. I th- look a lot of that car sounds really good. And then you, you, I, if I sort of just push Pamela Anderson to the side for a second, right? Nothing is like, like nothing super against Pamela Anderson. But when you're like, so like Jamie Lee Curtis, Dave Bautista, um, Kirst, Christian, whatever her name is, Sabrina and Billy Lord and whoever else that I've missed. Um, that sounds like a good movie. So yeah, I'll, 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 yeah, fuck it. I'll fully invest. I'm changing my life. I mean, yeah. It it from the description, it sort of implies that Pamela Anderson is going to be the main character. Yeah, which so. look, I'm I'm not saying that that's a primary Pamela Anderson's. It's <laughs> the worst thing you've ever said. <laughs> Amy Adams is in negotiations to co-star alongside Jenna Ortega in Sony Three Thousand Pictures' Clara and the Sun, which Taika Waititi is set to direct, based on. Kazuo Ishiguro's New York Times bestselling novel. The film is being produced by Hey Day Films, David Heyman, uh, Garrett Bash, and Watiti. Uh, Clara and the Sun tells the story of Clara, an artificial friend designed to prevent loneliness. Clara is purchased by a mother and a bright teen named Josie who adores her robot companion but suffers from a mysterious illness. This is the story of Clara's quest to save Josie and those who love her from heartbreak and how in the process Clara learns the power of human love. No. I'm Taika, no. <laughs> Taika has to earn some love back. No. He needs to earn your money back. <laughs> yep. No. I'm done. No. This sounds like what they wanted Megan to be when they were designing her. Oh, I was about to say, that doesn't sound at all like, like the movie. No, like, I'm like sure the in movie the world. They set out to no, make no, no, no. Was... <laughs> like, like in, in the world of the film, this is what they wanted me yeah, to do. Yeah, okay, okay. That makes yes. all sense. Yeah. I was like, I don't think that's how. Like, like when they set out to make <laughs> horror movies, Ash, I know you don't understand why they make them, but they set out to purposely yep. make them. Yeah. Uh, Top Gun Maverick and Wooshlash star Miles Teller is in talks to join Lion Gate and Universal's International's uh, Un- 
Antoine Farquhar's directed Michael. Uh, Telloy here would play an attorney in the Michael Jackson biopic. Exactly which of Jackson's attorneys we will see. The late uh, Howard Weitzman was known for defending Jackson and his estate, in particular against creditors' claims and accusations of pedophilia. Uh, if the deal makes, Teller would join a booming cast that includes Coleman Domingo as Patriarch Joe Jackson, Nia Long as Mother Catherine Jackson, as well as Jafar Jackson, Michael Jackson's nephew, who will play the title role. No. The, the, no, no world does any movie around this subject matter get done in a just uh, way. It's either going to be too positive, too negative, n- n- not neither there. I'm going, no, no. That's fair. Stay away from the... <laughs> I would, yeah, for a while. Like, we need to, like, 50 years from now, maybe? I don't know, but, like, currently, there's just, no. It's never going to. Lamorne Morris, Dylan O'Brien, Corey Michael Smith, and Matt Wood have joined the cast of Sony Pictures SNL 1975, which will be directed by Jason Ryman, based on the real life behind the scene accounts of the opening episode of Saturday Night Live. Full invest. That sounds awesome. It does sound awesome. Uh, Terrence Howard is set to star opposite Kevin Hart and Samuel L. Jackson in Peacock's limited series. Fight Night, The Million Dollar Heist. Uh, the project reunites how with Craig Brewer, who will direct and executive produce the first two episodes of the series. The pair previously worked together on Brewer's uh, 2005 feature, Hustle and Flow. Uh, Fight Night tells the infamous story of how an armed robbery during the night of Mar- Muhammad Ali's historic 1970 comeback fight changed not only one man's life, but an entire city's destiny. I literally brought Hustle and Flow on Blu-ray like last week. Wow. Have you ever seen that movie? Is it a sign? No. It's a pretty good movie. But I believe it's hard out here for Pimp. Yeah, I was going to say, do you know the song though? (laughs) It's hard out here for We used to like play that in school, like me and friends and um, my girlfriend at the time and everything. We all loved, like even her friends, like all loved that movie for some reason. So, um yeah, I'll, I'll partial invest. A lot of that sounds interesting. And then you said like Kevin Hart at some point. So, I don't know. Yeah. yeah. I believe Kevin Hart's playing Muhammad Lee. <laughs> it's punching up, that's for sure. <laughs> it's the only way you can. Uh, not since 2019's crime thriller of The Gentleman has Oscar winner Matthew McConaughey gotten a chance to thrill audiences. But it's soon, but it looks like he's getting closer at finding his next big project in a his next project in a big way. Sources tell Deadline that McConaughey is in negotiations starring Comet Film and Blumhouse's The Lost Bus with Paul Greengrass in negotiations to direct and Apple Original Films in discussions to board the film. Uh, Brad Inglesby adapted The Lost Bus script from Lizzie Johnson's book Paradise, One Town Struggle to Survive an American Wildfire by Lizzie Johnson. Uh, about 2018's Campfire, the became the deadliest fire in California history. The film story will be told through the perspective of heroic bus driver Kevin McKay, a school teacher, Mary Ludwig, who helped navigate a bus full of children through the deadly wildfire at the town of Paradise is caught in the destruction and chaos. There is already a 2021 film called The Last Bus. Um, Lost Bus. Oh, Lost Bus. I was going to say, not the, okay, I typed in The Last Bus, so I was like, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll fully invest. That sounds really uh, good, interesting subject matter. Obviously, sad subject matter, but um, yeah, I'll fully invest. I mean, with all that subject matter, you can't let the title The Lost Bus. I wrote The Last Bus. Or are you saying that's what... No, no, no I'm, saying, like... I'm saying as a title in general. Right. I don't yeah. think that's very enticing. No, I would agree. Because when you, when you read out the title at first, I was like the magic school bus <laughs> <laughs> and then he started saying stuff about california and fires and stuff and i was like what uh ahead of focus features february 23rd release drive away dolls the road trip caper marking her first collaboration with academy award winner ethan cohen margaret qualley has been set to star in honey don't the filmmaker's latest for the same studio qualley in the in the car joining qualley in the cast are aubrey plaza and chris evans details on the film's plot are currently under wraps Though Deadline understands the comedy in the vein, of, in the same vein as Driveway Dolls, fully invest. Easy. That is. I can't believe Driveway Dolls isn't out yet. I feel like we've been waiting three years for this. Movie. It's 
later this month. Crazy. Tyreek Withers is set to star alongside Marlon Wayans in Monkey Paws Goat for Universal with Justin Tibbing. The project, based on a blacklist script by Zach Ackers and Skip Bronke, centers on a promising young athlete who is invited to train with a team's retiring star. Nah, that's nothing to go on. I'm not investing. Isaac Gonzalez is set to star opposite John Krasinski and Natalie Portman in Apple's Fountain of Youth, a feature film based on an original idea that will be directed by Guy Ritchie and hails from Skydance Media. Uh, also starring uh, Domhnall Gleeson, uh, the film will be produced by Apple by Skydance, uh, will be produced for Apple by Skydance, Vincent Films and Project X Entertainment. Written by James Vinderb- Vanderbilt, the pick follows estranged siblings, who partner on a global heist to find the mythological fountain of youth. They must use their knowledge of history to follow clues on an epic adventure that will change their lives and possibly lead to immortality. Yeah, fully invest. Sounds fun. Like the cast. Guy Ritchie's pretty good most of the time. He is. James Randall. Right. Sure. Last film. Chris Rock has made a deal to develop to direct another round based on the 2020 Thomas Vinterberg nope. directed black comedy that won the Oscar for Best International Feature as well as the BAFTA. Uh, the film is an Appian Way and Make Ready production for fifth season. Jennifer Davison and Leonardo DiCaprio are producing for Appian Way. Scripted by Vinterberg and Thomas Tobias Lindholm, Denmark's Another Round starred Mads Mikkelsen, Thomas Bo Larson, Magnus Millung, and Lars Ranth playing four high school teachers who conduct an experiment and maintain a constant level in, of inebriation throughout their workday. Restless and bored, they act on a theory that a certain alcohol level boosts creativity and happiness. Nah. No. Pretty good. Um, would suggest just watching another round. I mean, it's going to be different at least. Doesn't mean it's good. But it doesn't mean it's bad yet. I, just... You know, I think there's potential of taking the idea of four likely black men uh, trying to stay drunk all day, every day for an extended period, could be very interesting in the American climate. I don't know. I just I have no faith that this movie will have anywhere near the same. Um, interesting underbelly to its... You didn't enjoy Spiral? <laughs> I feel like they're very different equations, and I thought the Spiral was okay. <laughs> okay, well... You didn't watch Chris Rock's Top 5? No, I didn't. That was, that was his movie? Mm. Uh, oh, interesting. He's also directing a Martin Luther King movie <laughs> at the moment. Uh, all right. What is going on with his career? <laughs> what is going? What Slaps Will Smith and it just goes wild. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, make being slapped by Will Smith will make you question your life. Choices. Get hired in the industry now when I'm the best director, motherfucker! Bam. <laughs> <laughs> all right, we have to wait for all those movies to come out, but these are some movies you don't have to wait for. Let's give some thumbs to trailers. Of course, you can find all the trailers we're about to talk about in the show notes below. Kicking things off, we've got Back to Black, directed by Sam Taylor Johnson, starring Marissa Abella, Jack O'Connell, Eddie Marson, and Leslie Manville. Singer Amy Whitehouse's tumultuous relationship with Blake Fielder Civil inspires her to write and record the groundbreaking album Back to Black. Uh, Dylan, what do you think of this Amy Winehouse biopic? Uh, I'm going to go double thumbs up. Look pretty great. I, you know, I respect, I guess, would say Amy's music. I wouldn't say I'm the biggest fan or anything like that, but yeah, the trailer looked like a solid biopic. Hopefully they go, here's the thing, if they do it right, it'll be sort of like, it'll be a hard watch, but I don't know how, like, how soft they're going to paint it. So did you ever watch the documentary? No, and because I heard it was hard to watch. So, <laughs> <laughs> just from like sometimes watching people go down that road is like hard. It's hard, yeah. When it uh, people, you know. Yeah, I'll give it two thumbs up. I mean, it looks like a standard biopic. 
Uh, but you know, I feel like they've nailed so elements like her voice and that kind of stuff. So, uh, yeah, it looks like it's well acted and like it's paying respectful homage rather than kind of a bit of a cash in. So, well, after I watched the trailer, um, uh, I googled it up to see what the go was. And they said her family or whatever state was quite happy with the signing off on this one. So, I don't know if it was the script or the casting, but yeah. All right. Uh, so Back to Black is coming to cinemas on the 18th of April. Next trailer is for Tarot, uh, directed by Spencer Cohen and Anna Palberg, starring Harriet Slater, Adane Bradley, Aventika, and Jacob Babylon. When a group of friends recklessly violates the sacred rule of tarot readings, never use someone else's deck, they unknowingly unleash an unspeakable evil trap within the cursed cards. One by one, they come face to face with fate and end up in a race against death to escape the future foretold in their readings. So, what do you think of this horror, horror movie trailer? Uh, one up, one down. Looks like a sort of throwback horror movie. I really enjoyed the. I think the standouts are just the designs of the the creatures or and like the card art and stuff like that. Like all of that looks really cool and interesting. The the heart the 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 kills and stuff looks pretty straightforward for a, this sort of fair um almost a final destination feel with death coming for you i guess sort of chasing you um fun cast jacob battle on battle on whatever is um uh fucking ned is in it so yep you know why not uh yeah one i wonder i'll give it two thumbs up i think it's a good Whoa. horror trailer i think it's it's i think i still pointed out like it's a trailer that uh isn't focused on plot. It like kind of showcases the gimmick of the yeah. of the film, uh, and showcases all the designs of the the cards, which yeah. is you know yeah. the most interesting part, and probably is the thing that's going to entice people to go check this out. Uh, I've never heard the idea of you can't use other people's tarot cards. No, I <laughs> that being know. a thing. Um, but now that I know, it's also, yeah, I, I don't know. Also, this kind of gives the vibes, like at least the setup vibes of like talk to me and that kind of stuff, or like. I guess anything where a bunch of teenagers show up in the one place and do something stupid That's like and then get all the ramifications for it. 80% of horror movies? I'd know. And, yeah, I guess it's, it's <laughs> like every single horror movie, really. Teenagers um, doing things. Yeah. Lots of... I, li- I like the car sense a bit. That was cool. Mm. With, like, the, with the sensors and stuff? With the sensors <laughs> around it. Yeah. And then Hangman in the mm. condensation. Yeah. I thought there was some interesting visuals in the car stuff, so... All right, uh, Taro is coming to cinemas on the 9th of May. Next trailer is for Mary and George, uh, created by DC Moore, starring Julianne Moore, Nicholas Gallatin, uh, Tony Curran, Laurie Davidson, and Trine Dralholm. The story of the Countess of Buckingham, who molded her son to seduce King James I and became his all-powerful lover through intrigue, becoming richer, more titled, and influential than England has ever seen. What do you think of this trailer, Dylan? Uh, yeah, double thumbs up. Looks too like you're like, is this really a thing? But apparently, it's a thing. Um, looks quite <laughs> fun. Uh, cast looks great. I think Julianne Moore looks really good in it. Not something, not something I've ever seen her do this type of or that period and role and stuff. I guess, but um, yeah. I mean, it looked. I mean, based on the poster, I got I expected one thing, and then I watched the trailer, and it was not what I thought. So, um, yeah, double thumbs up. What did you think it was going to be? Well, the poster I looked at was just a generic one of like them looking at the camera, like not with the the one where he's like hugging the actual uh, king or prince, whatever his name is. Uh, so I don't know. I saw. It. I was like, oh, maybe it's just some like generic fucking period piece thing. And then the trailer is obviously a, a, like a lot more faster paced and like obviously like plays them as these sort of I don't know mobsters. <laughs> Yeah, I'll give it two thumbs up as well. Uh, it's got kind of, I guess, kind of got a little bit of the great vibes hmm. uh, in that it's a period piece and kind of... Not uh, ultra serious? Like... Not ultra serious, and obviously there's, like, caper elements of it and, like, them trying to seduce the king and, like, uh, you know, that element as well. Julia Mill looks really good. Like, there's the jokes about her being dressed by a prostitute and, hmm. uh, you know, her flame even being off colour. Um, yeah, I thought it was pretty solid. 
interesting period piece film uh series so yeah mary and george will premiere on binge from the 5th of march next trailer is for before dawn directed by jordan prince wright starring levi miller travis jeffrey ed oxenbold and stephen peacock Jim Collins, a young man from the Outback, joins the Anzac to fight on the Western Front with the hope of making a difference, leaving behind his family-run sheep station. However, the muddy, ruthless, and unforgiving nature of war begins to weigh heavily on Jim, leaving him with a profound sense of guilt. As the battalion dwindles and hope fades, Jim's redemption comes in a pivotal moment during one of Australia's most significant battles. He must choose between risking his life or living with the weight of leaving another soldier behind. Uh, Dylan, what do you think of this Australian war movie film? Uh, looks pretty straightforward for an Australian war film. High budget than some. Uh, so I'm going to go one up, one down for the trailer because like it's what could be exciting and different about this one is not what's seen here. It's like the story we'll have to watch the film for. So I'll go one up, one down for that. But as a trailer, it looked pretty mostly straightforward for the genre. Yeah, I agree. It's one up, one down. Uh, not a lot here that made it stand out from any other, you know, war movie trailer mm. or film. Uh, it's hard to make them stand out. I'll I'll give them that. I mean, it is a pretty generic setting. Yeah. Um, you know, it's hard to make trenches feel unique in any little way. Um, but you know. You have to do something, and nothing about the story or anything kind of you know screams original. <laughs> no, I mean the idea that you'll have to like maybe there's a more character be- built around these. Yeah, I don't know. We'll see. It's in the maybe the full movie, but yeah, that's what I mean. Like the trailer just. Yeah, the trailer is not good. <laughs> mm. It doesn't do a very good job of making you want to see the movie. I'll mm. say that at least. Uh, but Before Dawn is coming to cinemas on the 4th of April. Final trailer for this week. The Ministry of Ungentlemanly Warfare. Directed by Guy Ritchie. Starring Henry Cavill, Isaac Gonzalez, Alan Richardson, Alex Pettifer, Henry Golding, Carrie Ewells. Based upon recently un- recently declassified files of the British War Department and inspired by true events. Uh, this film tells the story of the first ever special forces organization formed during World War II by UK Prime Minister Winston Churchill and a small group of military officer- officials, including author Ian Fleming. The top secret combat unit, comprised of a motley crew of rogues and mavericks, goes on a daring mission against the Nazis using entirely unconventional and utterly ungentlemanly fighting techniques. Ultimately, the audacious approach to changed the course of history course of the war and laid the foundation for the british sas and modern black ops warfare dylan what do you think of the trailer for this latest guy ritchie film i think it's yeah double thumbs up fantastic what a lot a lot of fun this trailer is just henry cavill sticking his f- tongue out blasted a bunch of people i you know you watch this trailer and you go yep i'll watch that right now thank you very much looks like a lot a lot of fun i don't know how much of the true story has been done justice in this <laughs> <laughs> whatever it just looks like a good time uh yeah two thumbs from me uh and seeing this trailer after watching argyle i'm like yeah thank god jamie Havel, henry cavill's doing some fun stuff uh this is the kind of stuff you wanted to see him doing you know, post Superman. Like, go have some fun doing crazy, wacky shit with Guy Ritchie. Uh, it also made me very sad that we're unlikely to ever get a uh, second uh, Man from Uncle film. You know? Yeah. Well, do you know what I was thinking, actually? is It's crazy that Guy Ritchie now has a film coming out called The Ministry of Ungentlemanly Warfare. He has a TV series coming out called The Gentleman, which is a spin off to the movie The Gentleman, but that movie yep. is not connected and neither is the TV series to The Ministry of Ungentlemanly Warfare, even though all three have Gentlemen in the top. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> Just to ball down. Yeah. Anyway, full of fun facts. Though. The series of events, but yeah, it looks like a bunch of uh, crazy things. It's funny to see in Alan Richardson, uh, this massive dude with tiny glasses. Uh, yeah, it looks like a bunch of mayhem, and how could you not want to see a bunch of Nazis get brutally murdered by the former Superman? Mm. Former Superman teams up with James Bond, um, the guy playing 
Jack Reacher, and Curry Eels being Curry Eels. Yep. Yep. So this is releasing in the US on the 19th of April. There is currently, as far as I can tell, no Australian release date. It'll come out here. It will definitely come out here. Um, Dylan, this week, what do you want to watch? This week, I would like to watch... Uh, I don't think anything stood out to me, to be completely honest. Um, I would like to watch nothing. No, I got nothing. I got absolutely yeah. nothing, I don't think. It's a pretty light week this week. It is pretty uh, shithouse. Uh, I would probably check out Suncoast, which is about to release on Disney Plus. That's the uh, Woody Harrelson, Nico Partica, uh film that we talked about being at Sundance. But the more interesting stuff has probably been released before you listen to this podcast. Bottoms, the fantastic uh, comedy, is releasing on Amazon Prime on the 6th. So watch that there on Prime Video. Uh, and then Dream Scenario is coming out on streaming, apparently. This, uh, the 7th. So we'll probably talk about those instead of anything that's actually coming out this week. Is what it is, you know? Not much happening in the new releases in the world. Uh, yeah. Time. All these streaming services, all these devices, and, you know. I mean, I would say go watch yeah, The Dry 2 if you want to support for uh, the yeah. film, but obviously I said it was the six or whatever I gave it. I mean, maybe this week, week, make it is a good sign for the dry two. I, like, Nothing yeah, to see. Go watch the dry two. That's true. Yeah. Panned out for them. Yeah. All right, let's know what you want to watch this week or what you're excited for from Netflix slate this year by going to explosion.com slash Twitter on Chump to just discord at explosion.com slash discord. If you want to help us out here, what do you want to watch this review on Apple Podcasts or on Podchaser? Leave us five stars, and you can leave five stars, or just tell people about the show. And if you've enjoyed this episode, thought it was worth a dollar, head on over to our Kofi page at explosure.com slash support. Thank you very much for listening. Until next time, keep watching stuff, I guess.